to the Performer's Guide. My name is Kristen Rayling, and today I thought we would try something different. So in the Performer's Guide, I have many different platforms that I offer services on, and the Performer's Guide Facebook group is by far the most popular group that we have access to. There's over 4,000 members, and in there I ask a lot of questions, and also you, the members, ask a lot of different questions. And so I thought it would be really fun to do reaction videos where I read through my questions and your questions and everybody's responses and make them YouTube videos. And so this will be a hopefully new series that I do here on YouTube that is more reaction style videos as opposed to just tutorial style videos. So let me know what you think about this style content down below. So what we're gonna do is take a look through the Performer's Guide Facebook group. And here you can see that I ask questions often. And so one question that I asked yesterday is, what upsets you the most as a professional performer? And so often I'll ask questions in the group and then give myself a day or two to let everybody respond so that I can go back through and read and respond to everybody's messages. But this response or this question post already has 83 comments in it. And so I was like, okay, you guys. <clears throat> All right, everybody, you've got a lot of things that upset you as a performer. And so I thought I would take some time and go through um, some of the comments. I don't know if I'll have a chance to read through them all. We'll see how long it takes. And I'll just pick some of my favorites or just some at random and answer, give some feedback on some of the responses, and hopefully try to answer some of your gripes about what upsets you as a professional performer. Okay, so we'll just go over the top three that I see right here. So the first one I see is from Stasia Stone. She says, dealing with other people's egos. Ugh, as a performer, that's a big one, right? We are all in this together at different places in our careers and wanting different things. I can't stand sharing the stage with snobs. And then I went to reply and I really liked her response to her own message and said, which ironically probably makes me a snob about that. <laughs> so I think that's actually a good thing to be snobby about, right? Is that we want to sort of put our egos aside as much as possible as performers. There is so much of this profession that does require an ego. Um, but we don't want to let that get inflated and let that get in the way of our judgment and the way that we treat other people on and off stage before or during or after our gig, right? And so the next one I see here is from Danny T. <clears throat> she says, Danny T says, Arguing with condescending men about their dangerous rigging solution. And audience members that have no respect for cornered off boundaries under the rig or in a fire circle. Okay, so those are two pretty annoying situations there. Let's break them each down individually. So first we have arguing with condescending men. I mean, really just anybody who's condescending. I've definitely dealt with both men and women who have been condescending about um, <laughs> whatever situation, either the rigging situation or however we, we provide our services as though they know the solution for us. And <clears throat> the best is just to really not argue with them as much as we can and always just present your side of it without arguing. And then as far as the condescending part, I feel like I... No, this is easier said than done, but we just want to let the condescending nature of anybody's tone just sort of roll off of our back and really try to listen to their words and 
cut out all the condescending parts and only respond to the parts that are actual feedback and actually good solutions. And sometimes there's only a few sentences in a wide array of sentences that's actually constructive feedback, and we just want to focus on that. And if it's none of it's good feedback, then just think into that time. And audience members with no respect for cornered off boundaries. Okay, so this is a two-parter, right? One is that they're not respecting boundaries, and two, I always just try to think of what can I do better to create better boundaries. I'm working on that in both therapy and in the contract, <laughs> right? Um, and I see this coming up as a question all the time of how to create a better audience barricades. And so maybe we'll go over that in a different video as well. Um, but yeah, so part of it is just realizing, okay, I need to make better bar barricades. And then the other is how do I get other people to respect the barricades because sometimes i'll even lay out a table and people immediately start putting their drinks on it and that's so annoying and it's just the same as a barricade sometimes i use the table as a barricade okay alexis power says egotistical people i can already tell this is going to be a theme of this right how often are we dealing with egotistical performers, egotistical club owners, egotistical riggers. Um, so maybe I'll do a whole one uh, different video about dealing with egos. Um, just general bad attitudes, people who aren't your superior in the production, like the venue or theater owner. Yes, yeah, see? Uh, but act bossy and try to treat you like their servant. Yeah, see, I don't like to work with clients like that either. We're not their servant. We're not doing them a favor. They're not doing us a favor. We are two people entering into an agreement, and we should both enter into a mutual respect, mutually respected agreement, right? Um, and the second I start to feel like clients don't respect me, I'll continue the agreement through the end, but I'll know that that's not one that I'll want to pursue in the next time. Okay. They also say people who seem to be in every production, but act like they don't want to be there. They're not having any fun or act passive aggressive backstage. Yes. I, I also don't understand that. I feel like a good attitude will get you much further than a bad attitude. And Obviously, some people have bad days. I have bad days. I've been in a bad mood, right? But when you start to have a bad attitude and it starts to become a recurring habit over time, that's when we want to uh, check ourselves. And sometimes we can notice in other people, but we really want to also start to recognize that in ourselves of when are we being that person and... Um, being a grumpy person because sometimes I notice myself not checking my emotions at the door and then lashing out at somebody or being grumpy right and so we don't want to do that we don't want to be the bearer or receiver of that Dan says it's annoying when I mess up of course I try not to let it show but yeah I completely agree with that especially when you mess up right at the pinnacle point when everyone's looking at you or within the first 30 seconds of a really important routine that you practice forever on I can just kind of set the whole mood down a little bit for the gig but it's got to persevere and continue on uh and yeah just like you said try not to let the audience know because for them they're really just there for you to have fun and to enjoy so they're not necessarily uh as emotionally distraught about us messing up as we tend to be <laughs> um raza vitalia says people who don't pay you a deposit or give you the money on site that withholding money trip and having to play a power hungry waiting game i have to grovel alongside for the money it's so unprofessional, yo. I feel you. I don't like to play that game either, which is why I tend to not deal with money on site. 
I'll either do a hundred percent deposit up front or or payment up front. I don't usually call it a deposit. Um, or I'll do fifty percent payment beforehand or fifty percent payment. And it's usually within two weeks, um, is standard. And you can also do, you know, net seven, you could do 48 hours afterwards, 24 hours. Um, but you always want to make sure that you have the contract that clearly states it, but then also sending them an invoice uh, directly after the gig so that you can get that process. Because oftentimes companies do need an invoice physically sent to get the money sent to you. But Oftentimes they say they're going to, and then they don't, and it can be so annoying. And I, honestly, I get messages so often from performers who have sent in a contract, they didn't get the payment in time, and they don't know what to do. And I'm going to do a whole different video about that, about what do you do, how to send an invoice, and what do you do when there is no invoice payment sent in a timely manner. Benjamin Corey says how a show goes when a client does the absolute opposite of what was agreed on for setup and then whose fault is it when the audience can't really see Okay, that also really bugs me. <clears throat> Sometimes I'll do a walkthrough, like the week before. Great. Space looks perfect. We talk about how it's going to be set up, and then you get their day up, and they're like, oh, guess what? We made this amazing change. And anytime they say that, they did not make an amazing change. They made the worst change they could have possibly made, usually. Or you go the day before. And you look at the venue and it's like, great, I'll check out the stage. Okay, perfect. And then the day of, they go, oh, we actually decided that we're going to keep the band on there. Or, uh, oh, we decided to hang all this paper mache hanging stuff above your fire show. <laughs> I've had all those things happen. And it's just like, no, that's not what we agreed on. Um, even just this most recent client I had kept trying to change the agreement even after the contract was signed oh maybe we don't need the hotel room oh maybe are you sure you need a green room oh we're not providing sound i thought you were going to provide sound just literally kept trying to change 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 and it was so annoying the whole time i can completely agree with that one so another one says fairy moon diva this is cute other performers judging you and saying you don't know enough tricks or to do it professionally. Also, performers who do not know their worth or have boundaries in place. Okay, so other performers judging you that you don't know enough tricks to do it professionally. So there's two parts to that. One is you could need to per surround yourself with better friends who support you. And sometimes people could, there could be a drain, uh, drain of truth, <laughs> a grain of truth in people's responses. So if, if someone tells me something that I feel offended by, there's usually a grain of truth in there somewhere. And so I try to take just that bit of truth out and then leave the rest, right? And so if it's like, oh, maybe I do need to put in some more work and learn more tricks. That doesn't necessarily mean the rest of it's true, that I'm not ready to be a performer. It just means I have more to learn in the process of it. And then sometimes it's just simply about surrounding yourself with people who actually support what you're doing because sometimes literally nothing you'll ever do is going to be good enough for them. And so just, okay, um, can move on from that. And so it's taking a little bit of both. Also, performers who don't know their worth or have boundaries in place. I often try to give the feedback for people of not spending on as much of our time worrying about what other people are doing and really focusing on ourselves. So anytime I read, I'm upset with performers who don't have boundaries in place, I try to flip that and go, okay, how can I set better boundaries 
for people who don't have good boundaries, right? Because I can never make somebody else have good boundaries. And so what can I do to have better boundaries with people that I know don't have good boundaries? Because that's something I struggle with personally. And it is annoying when boundary barriers get broken under direction. Um, then we've got Tommy Hijink says... Never getting photos or video footages from the media team so I can build my own reels or get more bookings. Oh, this is such a common problem, and there's a lot of factors at play that can cause this. Um, one is that the event team isn't actually the one hiring the photographer. It could just be some random person that you see that's a photographer, and they're under no obligation to give anybody photos or even know what they're looking at or what to get photos of. They're just sort of hobbyists, right? So you get that issue, or you get the issue of the event photographer being hired, but for the event. So they're really hired to get photos of the venue or photos of the event, and then they don't even know that we're coming in. And so it can be difficult when you see them clearly not getting images of you. And so in that instance, I'll just straight up just go up to the photographer and be like, hey, what up? I'd love if you get some photos. Do you want to go do a shot here during um, the next set or somewhere? You kind of figure out a space and go, oh, we want to just go shoot. More often than not, they're going to be super excited to do that because they love direction and usually no one's given them direction and they would love some extra cool footage. Um so that's another thing. And then the third is really understanding that it's really ultimately on you to get your own footage. And so I'll often write into the contract that specifies that I am allowed to have a, on top of my plus one, an additional plus one for any event or media person. Sometimes they will say, no, please don't do that. Sometimes they'll be like, yeah, sure. No problem. Sometimes you can upsell them into hiring your guy to do their event photography because they didn't even think about it um and so that's kind of the first half of the problem right is just having good photos taken and then the second half of that problem is receiving the photos right so often you they take a good photo and you're like yes got it and then neither person exchanged information because you both assume oh i'll get the info from the other person and then you talk to the event hire and they're like oh that wasn't me <laughs> I didn't uh, hire that person. I have no idea who it was. So you always want to make sure that you get their information and then you also give them your information. And then even still then, you the likelihood is maybe 50 to 25%. So it really is a crapshoot. And it is so annoying because I have had so many good photos and videos I know are out there. And I'm like, ugh, I'm never going to see that again. So Gina Cristiani says, when I mess up on stage and when the check is not given on the same day. Yep. So yeah, we talked about that earlier. Both of those suck. And especially, could you imagine if they happened on the same day? Like you already had a bad show and they're like, all right, I'm ready to go. And then you can't find the event producer or you get there and then they're like, no, there's no check. Or then not only do they not have the check, but then they have the audacity to have an attitude that you're asking them for the thing that you agreed on. You're just like, oh, so annoying. So I never deal with cash on day of unless they just hand it to me. You know, they walk up and they're like, boom, because that is the most stressful for me. At the end, I'm ready to go. I'm already annoyed. And then now I'm walking around the event trying to find them like, excuse me, can I have my money, please? It definitely does feel very degrading. I'm just like, you know what? I'll get it later. I'll, I'm going to go to the snack table maybe if that's. So, Taylor Roberts says, the general lack of awareness of how hard professional performers work from a client-producer point of view. And a lot of people seem to think we're just twirling around in la-la land, when in reality it requires an insane amount of discipline and dedication. I mean, this is just such the classic problem. They're like, oh, I'd love to hire you for a 15-minute performance. It's like, okay, but I need you to understand that that's not what you're paying for. <laughs> you're paying for the 
20 years it took me to be able to do this single trick in a 15 minute performance plus all of these steps leading up to this moment right here and you know i think that sometimes people just don't know what they don't know and then sometimes people are just being ignorant on purpose because they just want to devalue because that lowers the price because they're trying to price shop and so i really try to give compassion for people who just aren't really have no idea because i go into some professions where i'm like oh i need something done and then they tell me the price and i'm like oh my god i mean no no offense to you i just was not what i was expecting at all you know and i'm like i'm not trying to devalue you and i have people who come to me in that same way who were just like oh okay, no, that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's a lot of money and I can't do that. And then I have other people who are like, what? I'm just paying you to put on a costume and put on sparkles and go play with hula hoops. That can't cost $1,000. You gotta be fucking kidding me. It's like, oh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm actually very serious about it. So I, again, really try to know the difference and then try to just let the... It, um, purposefully offensive people just let that roll off your back as much as possible because it's going to happen a lot and the more you hold on to it over time it really does wear on you so you kind of just have to be like ah fuck that person move on okay eddie grant says the poor fire safety i have seen at other fire shows oh my this is a huge one this is why i cannot stress enough for fire safety um getting fire insurance having properly trained fire safeties and again really all we can do is work on ourselves so when i see fire safety or fire show that's just not it for me i go okay what is happening take note add it on to my fire tech writer like okay this is not included in my show and kind of move on because i find oftentimes when you go and talk to people they find it confrontational and they don't necessarily take it well <laughs> you know so some people can um it depends on the delivery and it also depends on the receiving end of it. And so, again, for the most part, I try to just take note and then use that as my value proposition of why they should hire my fire show instead of that one instead. That is so cringy to watch in the moment. You're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, Obadiah Thomas says, "It is. I think it is when the fault clearly is on the client but yet we get blamed maybe not even directly but we do the best job we could and they still say to themselves let's not hire that person again because they didn't perform well i told you not to put me outside in the direct sun with the plane flying over my head oh my god i can <laughs> i've so been here this gets me so mad I appreciate the caps locks and you can always leave them here because it's so true. I have definitely been like, okay, if you're going to have me juggle, it needs to be indoors or under shade or somewhere not in direct sunlight, at least facing, you know, south, north, facing north if possible. And so when, when a client makes a bad decision like this and then the show doesn't go well, it's so much easier just to blame somebody else. I mean, and not just a client, in life, right? How often do people make decisions and then you just feel, damn, I feel like I just got thrown under the bus for that. Or I feel like they just projected everything onto me like a mirror. like, Phew. And it's just because it's so much easier to blame everybody else but themselves. But you know they're doing you a favor they're letting you know that they're not the kind of person that you want to work with again and yeah it's annoying to find out that way but i just have to stand in my resolve of like no i did a good show or again i always try to take some responsibility of what could i have done better to make that better and what truly was the client's fault um because sometimes 
it is still up to me that even if they're like, nope, here you go, here's your spot in direct sunlight, that I have to make the judgment call and say, no, I cannot do this under the airplanes in the direct sunlight. I will literally be dripping in sweat. No one can hear me. No one's going to enjoy this. Not me. Not them. It's not happening. And then direct them to the thing that will be correct. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, not only did they problem solve for me, middle of the gig, but delivered the best show that they know is possible. And then if it's just truly not possible, then knowing, well, it's kind of a throwaway gig. It just kind of was what it was. So annoying though. Okay, Emily Humberstone says, working on teams with other performers who are not pulling their weight, staying in character, or doing whatever the heck they want. I can only do my best and go above and beyond, but those performers bring the whole group down. Why are you here? Last time this happened, I took a hiatus to work on my own self. I mean, this is... This is such a classic uh, group project problem, right? <laughs> I think we dealt with this since literally elementary school where you get a group project and there's just one person that's like, just never mind, guys. Give it to me. I'll do it. We'll just, just stop. And so I think you did the best thing you could, right? Take a break. Work on yourself. Learn how to build better boundaries with other performers who aren't pulling their weight. And... If you need to go solo, go solo. Because you don't really want to work with people who aren't providing the value type of performance that you are, right? I've definitely been in gigs and been like, oh my, this is not happening. This is not it. It's not always the people you're with, right? It could be your group is fine, but then who you're collaborating with is just not pulling their weight at all and making the rest of the team look really bad. And so... The staying in character, too. Oh, my gosh. Especially when you're, like, doing... There's two types, and this is really important. One is when you're going on and off stage. There's that moment of, like, coming on the curtain where people think that nobody can see them, and they still can. They're like, whoa. There's, like, that. That's really tough. And then also when you're roaming, which seems easier to a lot of people, but is often more difficult because you have to stay in character and engage. And if you just get, like grumpy or bitchy or out of character it's so awkward to the whole theme especially if you're supposed to be like a specific like princess or character or like something very very specific and then all of a sudden you start talking normally it's like oh man that's not the vibe <laughs> and that's why we work with professionals and really just try to um work with professionals Larry V says, how about those outdoor shows where they don't set up chairs or even pads for people to sit on? They expect everyone to stand and watch the show from beginning to end, sometimes with a hot summer sun beating down on you. Oh, man. Yep. And so, like you said, you've got to learn to talk to them beforehand and see what happens. And so often we just assume, oh, the client will understand. They'll figure it out. Those aren't the things that we need to think about. But they really are. We need to ask them, is this indoor or is it outdoor? Am I in the sun? No sun. Is the airplane going to be overhead? Are there going to be seats for the patrons? Are the patrons going to be facing the sun or am I going to be facing the sun? Are we both going to be facing sideways to the sun? It's important to know and get a full layout and the more questions that you can ask the client, the better. I think so often we're just so excited to book the gig. We're just like, books, let's do it. And really try not to ask too many questions in fear of scaring them away. But if you scare them away because you're asking the right questions, then they're, again, not the client for you. Abby says, I would say it was people undercutting in stupid ways. Like, they'd go to a client that regular pays me $1,000 for a live mini performance and offer to do it for 30 minutes, lol. The client usually comes back to me anyway. But I was like, you guys know your value at least. Oh, Abby, you and I have had many a conversation about this. And 
you know, I know that when you're saying undercutting, that you actually know the difference between undercutting and just underbidding. Um, and I can tell by the story here that you are actually being undercut, right? Which is when somebody knowingly knows what you're charging and then goes to the client and says, hey, I know that you pay Abby a thousand dollars. I can do it for less expensive. And usually they say I can do it for cheaper. And I've had someone do this for me. I had a residency at the Lafayette Hotel in San Diego and they called me in for a meeting randomly one day and I was like, oh, I'm about to get fired or something. This seems super important. And they like had these papers down and I was like, oh man, what's this? And it was emails that someone had sent me and I knew the person and I was like, what's going on here? And they were like, yeah, this person came in and w was emailing us back and forth. And so we just scheduled a meeting to see what was up with them. And they're totally trying to undercut you. They're like, they knew exactly what your proposal was and came in and just wanted to bid it lower. And we just straight up laughed at them and definitely still want to hire you and pay you your rate and would never want to work with somebody that would do that. And that's how you know you have a good client, right? And if somebody would take the undercutter, that again, that's not somebody you want to work with. They're never were somebody you want to work with. And then this other person who's undercutting, also not somebody you want to work with. But the whole encounter is just so upsetting in the moment to know that you're being betrayed by somebody that you know, and you're being tested and being talked about behind your back. But that ultimately works out because they choose you and that's awesome. Or they don't. And then that's really upsetting. But then again, still works in your benefit. But God, it's so annoying. Ugh. Dang, you guys, I'm getting upset reading all these now. I'm like reliving all my past traumas. <laughs> okay. Aria says, performers who jump into dangerous use of toys or fire without properly learning proper use first. Proper safety first. Loss of this importance over the years as a community grew. Venues not agreeing to performers bringing their own handlers or security and not providing proper in-house security or close space when intoxicated idiots and minors are attending. The exception of sharing, the expectation of sharing your props and all of my fire toys that end up being ruined or broken by somebody that has never replaced them. Okay, so you've got a few things going on in this one here. So first of all, people who jump into dangerous props without learning the proper technique first. And, you know, again, we can't really control what other people do as much as it really is annoying. <laughs> I think that's the most upsetting thing for me is, you know, we can't control people. We can only control ourselves. And so that's what we want to remember is that we can only control ourselves. And it's upsetting, you know. Sometimes it's really upsetting when you know the easy answer and you see it for them and then they clearly choose not to do that. So we can only meet them with compassion and try to continue to educate everyone as much as we possibly can. Venues not agreeing to having handlers or providing proper security. I mean, that's just a hard no. That's a, that's a non-negotiable for me. If I'm not allowed to bring the proper tech writer requirements, then this is not a gig for us to be put, putting forward together. And so sometimes the hardest part is just saying no to something that you know is going to be upsetting, that you know is going to be against your best interest. And same thing with sharing your props. That's definitely against your best interest. And I have absolutely no remorse or sympathy or feeling or effect for anybody that has expectations for touching my props. Because it's not expectations. It's audacity. Let's call it what it is. It's audacity. It's entitlement. And nobody's entitled to any part of you. Even as a paid performer, we are 
full of boundaries that we can set up for ourselves. And if someone would like to be upset with that, we cannot control that for them. But what you can control is just how you say it. So it's no thank you. Um, this is my performance prop and you're not in charge of it. It's usually just how I say it. Michaela Sparks says contractors not paying enough and not caring about the conditions for their performers. My next performance is in four days and I still haven't gotten my contract. Oh no. So there's a few things here. Contractors not paying enough and not caring about the conditions for their performers. I mean, I know the few events recently that we've been talking about that are just literally a whirlwind to watch of how can anybody produce a show and not care about the people as much as some of these people do. And it's insane to me to fathom honestly um so it's about setting boundaries for ourselves right because we can never control what other people do and so if they're not being safe if they're not providing good conditions just gotta walk away and i'm concerned about your event in four days that hasn't gotten a contract because I'm concerned it might not happen. Have you sent them a contract? And maybe that'll push things forward. Even if a client sends me a contract, I always send them my own contract as well back because it has my specifications, my tech writer, my needs, and my interests in mind. And their contract has their interests in mind. And if we need to combine it, that's one thing. But whenever a client lags on giving me a contract, I just send them one right away and also try to just get as much into the email as possible um i believe you're in america email does count as valid confirmation oh obadiah thomas again says after a great show oh my god that was amazing we'll definitely bring you back and then you never hear from them again including emails so that does happen and sometimes they'll bring you back but a few years later because oftentimes people like to cycle through but man it is so annoying when they're like no 100 percent, we're gonna have you back and then crickets or even worse they walk you all the way through a proposal and then decide to go a different way even after hiring you last year or for multiple years and i just have to say for myself, it's never confirmed until I have a contract signed, not even a contract sent. And so once you finish a gig, they didn't, they went down your sales funnel once, but it doesn't mean they just stay at the bottom of the sales funnel again. You do have to kind of start them back up at the top or the middle of the sales funnel again, and it sort of repeats itself. And so that is one thing that you'll have to think about over time is how to get people back down the sales funnel again and try not to get our hopes up when someone says they're going to because oftentimes they just say what they think we want to hear as well. Okay, so we'll do uh, three more of these and then I'll finish up. There are so many of these comments. Maybe I'll do a second video on this specific topic and then i'll definitely do more videos if you like these of me going through the different questions and giving my feedback i can do more of these style videos levi marin says trying to combat irrational fear of fire and explain that i am a professional fire performer with a decade of accident free experience because of my knowledge and skill regarding my safety management. Yes, that is such a big one, especially for people who have had traumatic experiences with fire before, or specifically who have hired bad performers before, and that can leave a bad taste in their mouth to wanting to work with fire again. Or if they just simply don't even know enough to know about it, they just know 
fire bad and fire equals higher insurance and liability. And so <laughs> sometimes I'll just mitigate it with, come on, you could use a new, and I'll point to some part of their, you know, you could use a new foyer, right? And I'll just sort of laugh and then they'll laugh and just sort of diffuse. And it doesn't have to be that specific joke, but oftentimes laughter and humor can diffuse somebody's walls and kind of bring them down to be able to hear and receive information. And so if you're finding that they're tight and rigid, try to loosen them up a bit and then they'll be more able to receive information. That's one. And then two, tightening up the presentation some way. And I know you know this, but having a really solid fire binder, having all of your insurance, all of your fuels, having everything laid out. And the more that you can not only just verbally explain, but really physically show, look, here are my certificates. Here's this. Here is the floor plan. Here's the flow of traffic. And sometimes people need a lot of information and sometimes people need less information. And so we just kind of sometimes have to work with the client's needs. Sometimes it requires more walkthroughs. Sometimes it requires a fire marshal walkthrough. Sometimes it requires us realizing this person is never going to hire fire. They just like the idea of it, but they're never logistically going to get it together enough to actually hire it, right? And so as a fire performer, that's kind of one of the biggest ones. You know, it's one of the bigger ones is either just the permitting in itself, but then once you get through that, getting through the client's mind and sometimes even the patron's minds of this is safe, it's controlled, we're not in flashbacks. Okay, Paul Dawson. Some of the questions I get asked by the public, oh my God, <laughs> the post-show questions are definitely a thing. But what do you do for a real job? Oh, that's nice, but what's your real job? Okay, but what do your parents think about you not having a job? How do you afford your life? Have you ever thought about going to college? Oh, man. You know, I try not to get offended by these questions. Even my well-intentioned friends who are like, oh, you should get a job or this and that. Luckily, I've been doing this for, you know, 20 years, so people don't really say that to me anymore. But even if they do, I try to just reflect back compassion for them, right? They probably have a job. So they're probably like, wait, if I have a job, everyone should have a job. And anything they ask sort of side-handedly, I feel like they're really trying to take notes and being like, wait, how do you not have a job? How do your parents feel about this? How does your spouse feel about this? Because they're like, wait, what would my friends and family think about if I didn't do this? And so oftentimes I think they just literally cannot fathom it. And then other times it's backhanded, right? Of like, oh, have you thought about going to college? Sometimes they're really well-intentioned. Maybe going to college was good for them or they wish they had gone to college or, you know, sometimes there's well-meaning well intention. And then sometimes they're just like, you should go to college, you know, quit your day job, you know, being a jerk. And then in that case, I'm kind of just like, man, I feel sorry for you that that's your mindset. <laughs> And it's like, man, you think you're annoyed dealing with that person. They have to be that person who lives with that mindset all the time. And so I try to just live with that and leave the gig and just be like, okay, I like some of those people's questions and some of them I didn't. And then it's also nice when there's other people, other performers there, because you can sort of process your interactions with people because it's a lot of energy, right? You're getting a lot of people and energy and a lot of times performers are introverts and so it's like oh my god and if you get a lot of really negative energy it's like okay wow and so it's nice to have another person there and be like man did you hear that question or this and that or me talking to this person and then you can kind of talk it through um but again i really 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 try not to hold on to anything anybody says to me because i really am just like okay that's their stuff they gotta work through <laughs> i don't need a job Nicholas Tovar says that beauty sells over talent. 
So I can definitely see where you're coming from on this one that, um, you know, there is a certain look of beauty that, that does sell over talent, but I think really talent does sell and it's aesthetics that we're looking for. It doesn't necessarily have to be talentless beauty. Um, although there is that of course. Um, but I think that there could be beautyless talent, so to speak for your comment, as long as is aesthetically pleasing in some way. So it's not that you have to be the thinnest or the, you know, the most this or that. It's just that you have to be fit and aesthetic and talented and a combination of all three. And then being able to uh, express that to the client in your selling points and having aesthetic branding and like your press materials. So... I can definitely see how that is a um, annoyance amongst many people in the entertainment industry. And I often, you know, do deal with that as well of, you know, not being the most in shape or aesthetic or even the most talented or the best. And you have to make up for those deficiencies for lack of a better word by leaning into what your talents are and what makes your performance beautiful in its own right and what gives it aesthetic beauty to your audience and so until you find that for yourself it's definitely very frustrating and then even when you find it and it doesn't hit correctly and it's hard to hit the algorithm it's hard to hit the marketing it's hard to find that rhythm and sometimes we never do and then sometimes we can find the wave and ride it and boy is it frustrating along the way I can definitely feel that okay and then we'll do the last one Michaela Sparks again I like how people came back with different um <laughs> traumas that they have <laughs> mainly um, people who use my shit in the green room without asking. Oh my God, this is so annoying. Like people who sit in my chair, put stuff in my cooler, put stuff on my table, use my water cooler and use all my stuff that you bring from home. Yeah. Cause you do a lot of, um, fairs and festivals too. So this is such a big problem. Not only at just like normal green room gigs, which is what I was thinking, but at festivals, it's so much worse too. Um, you come back, people are using your props, and then all of a sudden the batteries aren't charged anymore because people are using them or something's broken or missing or their kid is using it and then now it's broken. Um, but then once you add a festival situation to it, then it just adds a whole nother layer of annoyance. And the only way I... So, like, if it's a festival, the only way I can do it is if I have my own green room and everything's in its own 10 by 10 or its own little mini tent inside the tent. And it has to have a lock. And you really do kind of have to do that because even though everybody, even in your space, might be fine, someone could just wander in. It's like, who the fuck brought Steve in here, dude? And so, oh, it's super annoying. Um... And because it's some sort of emergency, just because they think they can use whatever they want in the green room. One time someone even asked to use my spirit gum to put on her ears. Oh, she started. I was going to say, oh, at least she asked. No, they just started using it. Oh, my gosh. See, if you ask, that's one thing. And even still then, you should, for the most part, bring your own stuff. We shouldn't be asking each other for stuff unless you oops, I forgot it, or, the, you know, maybe I overlooked it or something. Like, things can happen, and we're obviously always asking each other a little bit. But we shouldn't be just, hey, can I use that? Hey, can I use that? Hey, what's that? Hey, can I use that? Or even worse, when they're not around not using it. That is so annoying, and it's, it's just straight-up stealing, really, is what it is. Uh, but, of course, you were nice because you have to be professional. If they would have asked, you probably would have said yes every time. 
See, and that's what I'm saying. It's it's the audacity of people. And oftentimes we would say yes if they asked. And we would share our stuff. But no, they got to go use it without us. And that is super annoying. Okay, so this was my first round of doing feedback and reactions to the Facebook group for the Performer's Guide. Please let me know what you thought of this and how's the lighting, how's the sound, how's my background, um, how's the camera. Any feedback is always welcome. And please let me know if you like the style of video. I will be doing more. And also I'm working on different types of content for the YouTube channel. So thank you so much for joining me. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye.